Good evening. My name is Margaret Tracy, and I have the great honor of being the Dean of the Trudel Zipper Dance Institute here at the Colburn School. And an even greater honor for me tonight is to be co-hosting with a very special young artist. Cameron, can you please introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Cameron Fikes. I am a first year Colburn Dance Academy student, and I am so excited to be co-hosting this special <laughs> evening. <laughs> Thanks, Cameron, for being my co-pilot for the night. <laughs> we are thrilled to welcome you to our annual see performance of See the Music, Hear the Dance. This quote, See the Music, Hear the Dance, was made famous by George Balanchine, the founder of the School of American Ballet and New York City Ballet. As a trained musician himself, and one of the most influential choreographic voices of the 20th century, this idea of bodies visualizing music using the language of classical ballet was the foundation of Mr. Balanchine's work. And tonight, we are going to take you on a journey of music and dance through exploring excerpts from the repertoire of one of the most iconic dance companies in America, the Joffrey Ballet. Let's... <laughs> So let's begin the evening with some dancing and music. The first piece we will see is an excerpt from Sweet Sensan Padada, choreographed by Gerald Arpino, and music by Camille Sensan, featuring artists from the Joffrey Ballet, Geraldine Mendoza and Dylan Gutierrez, and pianist Ina Liu from the Colburn Music Conservatory. Please enjoy.
we're delighted now to bring out two um, wonderful guests to share in a conversation with us. Um, the first guest that will be joining us is Ashley Weeder. Ashley Weeder was born in Scotland and trained at the Royal Ballet School in London. At Rudolf Nureyev's advice, he joined the London Festival Ballet and became a principal dancer by the age of 20. Ashley then went on to dance for the Australian Ballet, the Joffrey Ballet, and finally for the San Francisco Ballet. During his illustrious career, he danced iconic works of Nureyev, Glenn Tetley, Frederick Ashton, and John Cranko, among others. In addition, working with American choreographic voices, such as William Forsyth, Gerald Arpino, Paul Taylor, and Laura Dean, he gained a unique perspective as a leading dance artist here in America. In 2007, Ashley was appointed as the artistic director of the Joffrey Ballet, where his passion and commitment to the company is evident in the quality that he has brought both to the dancing and to the repertoire, and where he continues to lead into the future. Among numerous honors and awards he has received as a leader, in December of 2019, Ashley was appointed to be a member of the most excellent order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen. And next, we're going to talk about Leslie Carruthers. And uh, Cameron, can you say a little bit about her? So, Leslie Carruthers served as a ballet faculty and dance institute director at the Colburn School of Performing Arts for nearly a decade. And we are so fortunate that she continues to share her vast experience as an artist and educator as a member of the Dance Academy faculty. Now, Leslie is a former principal dancer with both the Joffrey Ballet and Pennsylvania Ballet and enjoyed performing across the globe as an international guest artist. And as a leading dancer, she's danced a wide range of principal roles and works by Sir Frederick Ashton, George Balanchine, Yuri Kilian, Mark Morris, and Twyla Tharp, among others. And during her career, she originated roles in ballets by Robert Joffrey, Gerald Arpino, William Forsyth, and Dwight Roden. In addition to her expertise in teaching ballet, Leslie is also a trained instructor of Pilates and the Zene Romet floor bar classes. So we'd like to welcome Ashley and Leslie to the stage. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to be here. It's great to be back in L.A. Oh, we it's are nice so to... excited to have you here. It's and nice to have you back. Thank you. Wonderful. So we have some questions. We thought we'd just jump in and um, get to know a little bit more about the Joffrey and its history. Um, and can you share a little bit about that history, um, about how the company was founded in 1956 by Robert Joffrey and Gerald Arpino, and how it gained a reputation as America's company of firsts? Absolutely. Pleasure. Um, I, it, so Robert Joffrey started the company in 1956, but before that, he, had, he was a brilliant teacher. Leslie worked with Robert Joffrey many, for many years. Um, and so he had a school in the beginning, and then it was called the American Center for Dance. And then he started the Joffrey Ballet. And it was six dancers in a station wagon that toured this country east to west, north to south. And I think they just turned out performances one after the other after the other. And what was interesting is that Robert Joffrey never went on those tours because he was busy raising money in New York teaching. So would Arpino lead the troops? Well, Jerry was one of the original members, as was Glenn Tetley. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, you know, Jerry was very much a part of the founding of the Joffrey. Um, but they, the Joffrey acquired a name because they, they traveled everywhere. They were the Johnny Appleseeds of dance. And, it was, and that, that name set for a long, long time. Because they were taking dance to places that hadn't necessarily seen professional ballet before. And, uh, and so from then, um, Joffrey then uh, got involved with Rebecca Harkness. And that allowed the company to then go to Russia, to the Middle East. And they toured really the world. 
um, with new American choreography. And I think the thing about Robert Joffrey, when he founded the company, unlike many other companies, it was not based in a 19th century idea. It was a company where there was no ranking. So there would not be corps de ballet, soloist, principal um, categories. It was, as he said, an all-star company. And you could, you could dance a leading role one night and then participate in another role the next night. And I think that what it did, it strengthened the company from top to bottom and bottom to top and um, allowed you know, many people to come and work with the company. Um, the Joffrey Ballet was the first company to be invited to the White House. Um, and so that really put them on the map. Um, it was also when uh, Robert Joffrey created Astarte that Time Magazine put Trinette Singleton on the cover of Time Magazine, which was really huge at that time. Um, and then there have been many other first. Uh, the first company to do a multimedia uh, work, um, Gerald Arpino created Trinity, the um, first company to use a rock band. Um, oh, and what I, was the name of that piece? I remember seeing Trinity. It. Trinity. It, well, that was the yeah. name of the piece, I remember. And, um, and then I think, you know, things went, when, you know, when Leslie and I danced with the Joffrey in the 80s, it was a prolific time. And of course, Los Angeles was such a part of that history. Uh, I think of all the years of dancing at the Dorothy Chandler Theater, so many good memories. Leslie and I danced so many roles together. Um, so uh, for me, that's why being back in LA is uh, very, very touching to my heart. Um, and then we both actually left the company in 1989. Uh, Robert Joffrey passed away in 1988, and I went to San Francisco Ballet, and then um, I came back to the Joffrey in 2007. But in 1995, the company relocated from New York to Chicago. And I think that the time what was happening was funding for the arts was getting very, very complicated. In New York, there were so many demands from all these major companies that, you know, Mark Morris, Paul Taylor, Martha Graham, Alvin Ailey, New York City Ballet, American Ballet Theatre, it went on and on and on. It was saturated time. It was saturated. And, and uh, there were a lot of people who were passionate about the Joffrey in Chicago because we would tour to Chicago every year. And so um, a, uh, they, they brought together a board in Chicago and they literally moved the company overnight from New York to Chicago. And I think the first couple of years in Chicago were, were difficult. But I have to say, here we are, you know, 20, 25 years later, and um, I don't think the company could be in better shape than it's ever been. Uh, we have a, a very healthy balance sheet, which is extraordinary for the arts. I'm, I'm sure you know that. Um, <laughs> and, and we have a, an amazingly committed audience. And of course, part of our mission is still to tour. So we are thrilled that we are coming back to the Music Center in June of 2024. We can't wait. And we'll hear a little bit more about that later. Yeah. Um, so some of you may know that this year the company celebrates the centennial of Gerald Arpino. And can you speak a little bit on his choreographic influence on the company and, and how Lapata Do we just saw represents the essence of his creative voice? We did, a couple of weeks ago, we had a huge celebration in Chicago and it was so emotionally be a beautiful moment to see hundreds of past alumni come back to Chicago to celebrate two days of dancing Gerald Arpino's work. I think that for Leslie and I, Jerry was such a cornerstone of the Joffrey Ballet. And, and I'm, I'm gonna pass it to Leslie because she danced so many of his ballets. But we, we danced some of Jerry's iconic works, which was such a privilege. Um, and he really did shape and, for, and form the company stylistically, I think. Absolutely. Stylistically, he expected enormous energy from us in everything we did, and it became sort of a signature of, of a Joffrey dancer as this sort of eating up the space and flying across the stage. And an exit is never an exit. You're going somewhere else. And um, I think that we all became stronger and more uh, able to more expressive dancers, yeah. I think, because of his work. So physical. 
And yet each, was, each of his pieces was actually quite different. You know, there were different challenges, different kinds of music, different storytelling uh, going on. So there were, uh, there were always new challenges and new opportunities to grow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Leslie, to continue on that, you also danced quite a bit of Robert Joffrey's work. And as they really were the two founding um, genius uh, visionaries behind that company, talk a little bit about um, what it was like to work for him. And, and tell us, why were you interested in joining the Joffrey? And, and how was it different from other company experiences and professional experiences you had as a dancer? Well, uh, I grew up out here, and I trained in Pasadena, and a dancer just a little bit older than me in my same school, a Pasadena Dance Theater, Cynthia Anderson, a very, very beautiful dancer who went on to the Joffrey Ballet. She was my idol, and so I immediately cast my eyes in that direction. Uh, once I got to the school as a scholarship student, I realized I was home, absolutely at home. It was the right fit for me, and uh, going into Joffrey II, at a time when the company actually had been furloughed for a brief while, they were restructuring financially. So when I was in Joffrey II, we were actually the only Joffrey product performing. So uh, I think that we got a few extra resources and attention at that point. And then when the company uh, resumed after the furlough, uh, most of my cohort were taken into the company at the same time, so that it was this new, fresh start to the company, and certainly for us. Um, so I was really, really attracted to the repertoire as I joined the school, and, and as students, we were at the ballet every single night watching. And once in a while, we got to be in a performance, so when I was in Joffrey II, we got to participate with Rudolf Nureyev on Broadway in the Diaghilev evening. If you can imagine a better introduction to a professional life than that, I, I have yet to see it. But so I got to be on stage with Rudolf Nureyev and all of the company. Every night I was lady with broom, but you know, that didn't... <laughs> no but, small know, parts, <laughs> Leslie. But Robert Joffrey insisted he would go to each one of us and give us a story. So she, I wasn't just lady with broom, I had a back story. And I was expected to bring that to the stage every night. So I, I really understood uh, very early on that this was home for me and this was the place that I was going to learn and grow and flourish. Now you've, you both overlapped as artists at the Joffrey. Can we you did. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your onstage partnership? Absolutely. I came to the Joffrey in 84. And I think actually, I mean, Leslie, you can weigh in here, but I think the 80s were really, really prosperous for the company. Robert Joffrey was pushing the company. I think the fact that we were bi-coastal with New York and Los Angeles, we had a board in Los Angeles as well. So we were, we were riding a creative wave that was really fantastic. So there were things that Robert Joffrey always wanted. He wanted John Cranko's Romeo and Juliet. He wanted more repertoire of, of Sir Frederick Ashton, um, as well as having Bill Forsyth and Mark Morris and Laura Dean and all these other characters come in and create for us. But Leslie and I really, I mean, Round of Angels was really the first thing that we, we really got to do together. And I would say that Round of Angels, for those of you that don't know, is probably one of Jerry's most beautiful, iconic works. And I, I think, you know, Leslie, maybe you want to tell a little bit of that story uh, of Round of Angels. But, but we also went on to dance Romeo and Juliet together, um, The Dream by Sir Frederick Ashton together. Uh, we both were in Sanson. We were both in Kettentons together. What Monotones am I missing? Too. Monotones too. Um, and it was wonderful. We did so many performances together. So it's great. It's great to, to re-engage re with each other. It truly is. Um, I would, we were, <laughs> what was I supposed to be? You know what, I mean, I'll jump in because I, I'm curious. Yes. Um, tonight we're talking about music and dance and the influence of music on dance and, and the influence of dance on music. Um, so for both of you, and for maybe from your different, uh, from your current perspective roles, um, what do you look for Les, uh, Ashley, in musical awareness in your dancers, and Leslie, how do you develop musicality in your students? 
I mean, I was saying, I taught a master class this morning for the school, which was wonderful. And it was beautifully musical, I might add. I mean, I think music for me is everything, because as a child, I, I learned many instruments, but what I landed on was playing the flute and playing the cello. And I played for years and years and years, and, uh, and it was through music that I came to dance. So that has always been kind of first and foremost for me. And um, being a director of the Joffrey Ballet, when I came to Chicago, we had very little live music. And I was like, we have to make a commitment to our public and to the many talented musicians out there that we are going to provide live music. So we have done that. It is in our budget and we, we fundraise for it, but it is a totally different experience to have live music. And what it does to a dancer, it informs them so much and it moves us. And so when, when people audition for the company, you can see somebody who has an understanding of musicality, of phrasing of music, an un understanding of music and how it's written. So it's critical for me as a director, um, but it also was as a dancer. Yes, we, we are so fortunate to be in a music school and in, in, in such um, heady building and surroundings and faculty and we have live music in our classes every day and we don't ever take that for granted because it's not the norm in dance studios across the country we are incredibly lucky and we do know that and we really utilize the the pianist in our classes as a collaborator and a, and a collaborative teacher they are not just there to provide a rhythm or you know an eight count, they are there to actually help our dancers hear music and feel music and express music. Um, I like to talk a lot about uh, the power of and. Mm -hmm. I'm totally there with you that. You know what I'm talking the about. The power of and. and. And for us dancers is the moment of inspiration, both literal, you're taking your breath about to move, but also the informing of your body of what you are about to do is you getting in sync with your music, that you don't just wait to hear the note and then plunk yourself into the movement. It's got to have that moment of and before, before we move. And so we talk about that a lot. We also talk about phrasing a, a great deal. And phrasing to color a dancer's movement and to, it, to explore their artistry and also to understand that phrasing helps change the emotional content of movement, how you hit a, a note or perhaps smoothly glide through it can have a very different emotional re resonance. So we talk about that a lot as well. And um, I just feel so fortunate that to have such wonderful musicians in class with us each day as partners in teaching. And, and wonderful that we have these wonderful musicians with us tonight. tonight yes. What a beautiful partnership that is. Yeah, we look forward to hearing a little bit more from them later on. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to show a film clip from, from our Pino's Round of Angels. Now, could you briefly describe, yeah. describe the Potter Dove featuring you and Ashley? Yes, this was a ballet that was created, I believe, in 1983. Uh, Gerald Arpino had just lost someone very, very dear to him, very close to him. He was in deep bereavement, and as an artist does, he decided to create something to help him through it and to give him hope. And so he describes this work as, as a work of bereavement, but also there's, there is hope at the end, and this is all in the music. The music has a somber quality to it. This is the Adagietto from Mahler's Fifth Symphony, which is very familiar to many of you, I'm sure. But there, there's a bit of a story in that movement. There's there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there's a crescendo, and then there's peace. And I think that it's what he was looking for when he created this ballet. Um, Jerry was always heart. He, moved, he worked from the heart. Uh, I think Robert Joffrey was very intellectual, very uh, curatorial, but Jerry in the studio was just pure heart, and this is his heart really singing this ballet. And Ashley and I danced it many, many, many times. Many and times. this, we taped this in Aarhus, Denmark. Uh, and it was, I think, about eight, 1989. 
And uh, I know that Jerry um, Arpino was also inspired by a beautiful etching, uh, an Italian artist from the 17th century, and his name is Cav Cavaliere d'Arpino. And he, that obviously inspired him, thinking <laughs> that he was a forebear. And it was a beautiful etching of just angels encircling and protecting. And I think that that's the theme of this piece. It's very beautiful. I think that I, I have so many beautiful memories of us dancing it together. And I think that it was rare, because in our day, we didn't video anything. So to go to Aarhus, uh, Denmark, and, and film it for, you know, professionally, was a, it's, a, it's kind of a lovely keepsake. So um, I hope you enjoy it. Yes, and maybe they can bring the screen in as we make our exit stage right. Thank and you. please enjoy this beautiful excerpt. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
Wow. Cameron, what would you think? You know, one of the, the main recurring themes tonight is see the music, hear the dance. And one thing I just love is Gerald's musicality. You can see it in the dance, and you feel the emotion through the screen. You can see all of these things, and it's just really, really beautiful. Thank you. Yes. It's an amazingly hard piece to dance, but um, it is glorious. And it's, it's still in our repertoire. Um, we just performed it for his celebration, actually with Geraldine and Dylan, and they were absolutely magnificent. So it's, it has a special place for us all. Well, thank you so much. Uh, when I called Ashley about a week ago and said, is it okay if we show you and Leslie? There's this stunning video clip of the two of you, and so thank you for being gracious. Wow. Yeah, it's a pleasure, real pleasure. Now, can you please tell us about how the idea of making Tolstoy's Anna Karenina classic Russian story, which has been attempted numerous times to be retold through various stage adaptations, came to fruition and became a highlight of the Joffrey Ballet's repertoire? So when I was dancing with the Australian Ballet, they did a production by Andrei Prokofsky of um, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. And I have, as a child, you know, I have always loved the story of Anna Karenina. And I think that everybody can identify with the characters in that book. And it doesn't matter where you are, where in the world, we, we as human beings have the same four boys that we always have. We, you know, we, we cross lines and we pay the price for things. And so anyway, the version in Australia was for me not very satisfactory, but I, I always had it in my mind. And then when Yuri Pozikov came to the Joffrey and he did Don Quixote for us, and then he did a beautiful piece called Bells. And I said, Yuri, I want you to create an Anna Karenina, knowing that he would know the story really, really well. And, and he had ideas for the music, and there was a composer that um, composed the music for Maya Plasitskaya um, when, when she danced Anna Karenina, and it was by Shedrin. And I, I wasn't wild about the music. It seemed to me very 1940s Russian, um, and not quite where we are today. So I said to Yuri, that isn't going to work for me. And then he said, well, what about Scriabin? So um, he... We listened to a lot of Scriabin, and I said, I don't think that's going to work with, for me either. I said, I think we should have a commission score and see what a young composer can do with the narrative today. So enter Ilya Domunsky, who is still a very young composer, and he gave us the most magical score. It is truly a work of art. And I think that he and Yuri together, you know, they took 800 pages and condensed it down to what is the essence of that entire book. And I think that um, I am so proud of the company because Yuri loves working on the Joffrey Ballet. Um, and it's great to see the company have something created for them. So to bring it to Los Angeles is really, really so exciting. We had an enormous success within Chicago. We just performed it in Washington, D.C. to the most uh, unbelievable um, reception from the audience. So the fact that L.A. will get the West Coast premiere will be fantastic. And it's a great story, a story that does not ever belong in time and place, but it's a story about all of us. It, and you talked about Demutsky and Pasakov working together. Um, what do you know much about their process? Were they, um, you know, would you hear about? For instance, I used to hear stories about Jerry Robbins and Bernstein collaborating together, and Jerry would be out on the road, and Bernstein would send him a few bars of music or a few pages of music, and then he'd send it back and go, "I like this part, but not that part." What what was the process between Yuri and Ilya? So the first was taking taking the book and saying, "Okay, how are we going to do this?" because you can't literally do the book. So you take, so Anna Karenina is, is delivered in, I think, nine scenes. So you have the opening of the railway, you have the old man who gets hit by the train, you go into the seance, and so you, by doing these nine scenes, you put together a whole story. And, and Yuri would say, this is what I, I want to do in this scene. And Ilya would go away and he would write the music and, and it fit perfectly. 
I don't think there is a wasted moment in Anna Karenina. And, and, I th and what's complicated about um, Ilya's music is that, especially in the ballroom, you have six beats against a five-beat bar. And it's really complicated. And some of it sounds carcophonous on purpose. We feel the danger of Anna meeting Vronsky, a married woman. You know, and it's all in the score. And it's just, it's really amazing. Brilliant. Um, Ashley, what is the significance of telling an historic narrative with present day voices, such as Ilya and Yuri, um, for today's audiences, and how does this keep our beloved art form of ballet relevant for new audiences? I mean, I think that um, as human beings, we love, we love stories that move us. I think that we all love Romeo and Juliet and uh, many, many other narrative stories. And I think narrative is so, it's a mirror to who we are. And I think that uh, we have always a new generation um, and so, how do we show them the value of a narrative work? And I think that by, by bringing it forward, I think also the, the language that it's created in is really important. And I think that what you'll see when you see the Padada from Anna Karenina, that it seems quite contemporary and quite, it's very physical. Um, and it's very engaging. Everybody understands physicality. And, and so you have this like grounded, grounded classical ballet that seems so utterly free and contemporary. And, I, and people seem to acknowledge that. And, and staying on this topic, can you share a little bit of the collaborative process between Yuri and, and Ilya? You know, how are they influencing, influencing each other as, as people and artists? Well, I think because they have worked together before, so Ilya has done a couple of other works for Yuri. Um, also, the, the design team that we had on Anna Karenina, Tom Pai is, a, is an amazing designer. He did the set and the costumes. Um, and then we had David Finn, who did lighting, and Finn Ross, who did projections. And they were all involved with Ilya in the musical score because the score is driving everything in the work, and everyone took it from Ilya, and then, of course, Yuri's movement. But you can see, even with the projections, it's very cinematic. Um, there is no, uh, it, it completely keeps moving along to tell the story. And, it, and the way they've used uh, film, and live, it's all live, by the way. All that filming is live. So it happens. Oh, it is. It is. It happens off stage, but it's happening in real time. I didn't know and that. It's, yeah, it's beautifully done, but it's all within the musical sense of the work. So a huge collaboration. And it does. It has such a. It has a, a very fresh, as you mentioned, and modern take on this very old story. But like you said, it's a story of humanity and we, that we can all relate to. It really is, and it's about how do, we honor, how do we honor the people we love? You know, what do we commit when we say that we want to be with someone and then, and then we cheat on that person? What is the price that we pay um, for not honoring the line? And that is kind of the, the premise of the book. So after this next excerpt, which we're gonna talk a little bit about, Everyone has to go and see this production of Anna Karenina next June, next when June. We're at the Music Center. It really is a, a really special, special um, evening of, of works. Um, so we are going to bring our dancers back on and some more musicians, um, but can you explain to our audience the excerpt that we um, are going to be sharing with them tonight? Um, uh, and where, what the context is of where it falls within the story. So this uh, duet comes into the second act of Anna Karenina. <clears throat> um, Vronsky has taken Anna away to Italy, where they want to get away from all of the scandal back in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And their, their romance is starting to, to fade. You can see there is irritation with each other. He, Vronsky is getting tired of her, and it, it's, I mean, it's heartbreaking. Um, and so it ends up where you see the frustration and you see the breakdown of two people. 
and that he decides that this has got to end. And so she is the one that is left with nothing. She's lost her husband, her son, and her lover. Okay, that's a great setup. But it's very <laughs> beautiful. But it's Ooh. very beautiful. <laughs> Ooh, I'm getting nervous already. Um, we are so uh, we are excited to welcome back Geraldine and Dylan to the stage, along with Ina Liu again on the piano, and joining her will be Emily Wu on piano, Anne Kua on flute. Joshua Ho on the harp, and leading our musicians is our own um, beloved pianist from the Dance Academy, Saiko Fuji. So please enjoy this next I just excerpt. want to add one thing too. Absolutely. Is that for this particular duet, Ilya Domonsky, the composer, he made it for a quintet. So it's a huge orchestral work, but he also reduced it so that it could be danced in this intimate setting. So I think that's really special too. And he's Thank hoping to be in Los Angeles when we premiere it here oh, in fantastic. June. Fantastic, fantastic. So, yeah. Please enjoy. Enjoy.
Thank you. Very beautiful, Geraldine Dillon. Really beautiful. Thank you for beautiful. that. Absolutely lovely. Um, so while we let the dancers catch their breath, I thought we would ask the musicians. Um, I don't. Are you out of breath? Or are you okay? <laughs> You're doing okay. Excellent. Um, I thought maybe Ina, I would ask you. Um, you all um, have a very different process of preparing than dancers, musicians and dancers, um, all at this exquisite, um, proficient level. Um, but what is amazing and what the audience might like to know is that the musicians and the dancers met for the first time last night and had, what, an hour of work together? And then we ran through things again today on the stage. But um, Ina, can you tell us a little bit about your preparation for, for this evening? Um, so it's really different to play with dancers and like musicians we play by ourselves. Um, like with musicians we just practice our own repertoire, we tend to have more rebuttal and like more freedom on what we want to do in the music. Um, but working with dancers, we need to always um, care about their breath and their dance phrases and to be together with them. And that's one thing really uh, interesting and inspiring for musicians to play. And it is a great experience. <laughs> Thank you, Ina. Um, and maybe I might ask Anne um, to talk a little bit about um, the composer, Ilya Demutsky. Um, have you ever played his works before? And um, if he is someone new to you, what is, uh, your, what is the research that you do when you encounter a new composer? Yeah, so this composer, Ilya Demutsky, um, he's Russian, and he has a lot of music with um, like orchestra and chamber pieces, and of course like ballet music, which we play today in a reduced version for flute and synthesizer and piano and harp. So it's actually my first time playing this um, music by this composer, and I especially love like the color he has in the melody and this recurring theme. It's it's absolutely moving, and I think it's. It really fits perfectly with the novel and the story of Anna Karenina. Um, when I encounter like this kind of like new composer for me, I usually just like search online and I see like all this information I have and I try to know the story behind what's going on in composer's mind and what's going on with the novel and the story. So I think that helps a lot when, like, during the preparation process, and also with the dancer. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Okay, Jerry Dillon, we okay? Yeah. We can breathe. <laughs> so um, both of you have worked with Yuri Posikov a lot. You've danced Bells, Karenina, and many other things of Yuri's, and his Don Quixote. And I think that to explain to the audience like how, how the language informs you of where you are in the narrative, but also what it is to explore Yuri's uh, choreography. Because uh, Yuri has a famous saying when he looks at someone rehearsing his ballet and he'll say, uh, it's a ballet, but it's not my ballet. And there's a way of moving your body physically, so. Yeah. Um well, I've known Yuri actually since um, I was 11, so I've known him for a very long time. Um, and um, he's like, if you ever meet or work with Yuri, he's um, very funny, very straightforward, kind of boisterous. But um, what a lot of people don't know about him is that he's like quite an emotional person. And like you can see that in his choreography. And um, he doesn't like to choreograph like um melodrama like he it's like like not really have like facial expressions he's really about like physicality and like using your entire body and then you saw in the potato that we just did like it's very very physical and by the end like 
It's not that you're trying to find the emotion and storytell, you're already doing it through like your physicality and your movement. So like that's very eerie. Yeah. Preach. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was very well said. Um, I would say like, I mean, working with him is like he kind of has this happy medium between like freedom and order with his work. Like he's kind of a, he also is, can be um, like a little bit on a whim. Like if he runs out of ideas, he doesn't push it. And like there's some choreographers I actually admire a lot that will like push through with an idea no matter how much everyone's frustra uh, you know, struggling with it or, or, and whatnot. But Yuri's the type to be like, I'm out of ideas. Yeah, either go home or like clean what we did and I'm gonna go think and like, you know, that doesn't mean he's not working. It means he's kind of working like smarter in a way. And like, I think that's always interesting about him because he does, he gets the work done, but it has to be, for him, it has to be organic. And I think that also ties a lot into his work and how you end up feeling what you're supposed to be feeling if you're dancing it the way you're supposed to be dancing it. So. Um, to have a full length like Anna Karenina and to get to explore it over like an entire arc is, you know, really amazing because the first act for Vronsky is just like ridiculous. It's like a, a marathon, but you're sprinting the whole time. And then the second act is that way for Anna. So you, you get there emotionally because the, the work is just driving you and pushing you towards it. But then finding your own character on top of it is what takes it to the next level. And I think that's what's exciting about doing his work. I think also Dylan, like Yuri, Yuri was such a beautiful dancer and he was an amazing partner. And even now, you know, even though he hasn't danced for a long time and he's not in shape, he, he can do every single lift. Yeah. And, and you'll say, well, Yuri, I, that's impossible. And he goes, no, 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 yeah. here. But his yeah. partner, the, to partner in Yuri's work is really challenging, yeah. but also really rewarding. Yeah, 100%. His partnering work is really incredible, and I love to partner. It's like my calling card a little bit. And like, um, you know, we recently worked with um, on Liam's work in Frankenstein, and he's another one kind of like that. That the the pot of those are just so they make so much sense, but they're so difficult. And so you're actually in a place to do it your best because it's not throwing you for any loops, but it's so difficult that sometimes you need that little extra push or like extra bit of mind power to get through it. But then when you do, it's extremely rewarding and feels like really amazing between you, know, you and your partner as well. I, I would love to ask the dancers, um, because this is a, a unique setup to be actually on the same level with the musicians. We are so used to as dancers, there's an orchestra pit in front of us. Um, so we, we don't get that sense of having, hearing the music this way. How, how, what was this experience like tonight? Oh, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, they're amazing. We met them last night and like, um, it was very different last night because we hadn't worked together and like um, hearing the music versus like being with the dancers is the tempos are different. And um, even by this morning, like we were right there with them and they were with us and like having them on stage is like is a beautiful thing because I always feel like we can you know, ask for it to be slower or faster and we can prepare as much as we can, but it really is like a dance together, like feeling each other is the most important thing to create something really special. So. It was a pas de cease tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, I, I even found myself like looking over there a little bit. I mean, I didn't have a lot of time, but there's a bit in Italy where I, <laughs> like, uh, there was a bit in Italy, I, I stepped out to the side and I looked right at the piano and it was like nice. It was like, you know, interacting with what's there because it's there, you know, and also, I think like when working with live music, first of all, it's always, uh, it's always better that way because you know, collaboration is what makes art really work. And um, you know, it can, it's always like a give and take. It's like we can ask for something, but it, it's not gonna be exact. So there's times that we're gonna have to, like there were moments where we had to be like, all right, we usually do this at this speed. Now we have to take it down because we have, <laughs> There's more of them than us, so we have to, we have to do our part as well. So um, I, I like that process, and they were amazing, so. Thank you. Um. Yes, yeah, absolutely.
would love to um, ask our, our um, folks, our production folks, if we can lift the lights and open this up for some questions, if there are questions from the audience. I believe we have some ushers that can um, bring in some microphones. But we'd love to hear We'd love you. to hear, yes, if you have anything you'd like to ask any of us, the musicians, about tonight, what you saw about the Joffrey. Hi. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> um, you know, I watched the Joffrey when you were here in Los Angeles in the 80s and the 90s, and I miss you so much. Oh. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. And there is such amazing rep that the Joffrey has that nobody else does, and I would love to know if there are any plans for having the Joffrey come back to do rep. Mixed rap. We, we absolutely would love to. And uh, we keep talking to Rachel Moore at the Music Center. Um, you know, obviously, they look at the bottom line, and sometimes, you know, full-length narrative work has a bigger box office draw. But I also think that you see so much more of a company in a mixed rap program, so I completely agree with you. And I think being able to have the balance of both would be ideal. But I think that we would love to come back to Los Angeles on a, on a more regular basis would be great. Because I think that there is still so much love for the Joffrey. The, the last 17 years that we've been coming here, since I've been the director of the Joffrey, you can feel the love. I remember when we did Cinderella and we had people around the block waiting for returns. And, and then we did come with one mixed rep program. But um, yeah, I, I would say if you, just knock on the door of the music center and say, well, yeah, what about the Joffrey? Those were amazing years for us as well and unforgettable. I think we were here six weeks a year. Uh, that's a lot of performing and we brought lots of repertoire as you mentioned, and, um, and Robert Joffrey was never afraid to take risks. I remember our very opening night of the very first season of our very first uh, moment as the resident uh, company of the Music Center, we did William Forsyth's Love Songs on the program, which ended up being rather controversial. And it, it was a very in-your-face piece, and he did not play it safe. He went for showing the, the city who we really were. And I think that um, it became sort of a mutual love affair, the Joffrey and, uh, and Los Angeles. I certainly was happy to come home for six weeks every year. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for being here and for doing this, first of all. Um, and in the beginning, you mentioned how the Joffrey stood out um, originally because of the sort of physicality that was a little bit different, perhaps, than other uh, companies. Um, there's a French company that you may have heard of, uh, Ballet Prélocage. Are you familiar? Yeah. And they're very physical as well. Like, would there ever be a possibility of a collaboration there or performing some of those choreo some of those some of his choreographies I mean I think that he's an amazing car for pressure Kaj, and I, I think the idea would be fantastic I think it's like with anything you know you're always looking where where can we align the dates that we can actually get together but um, what is wonderful is that pressure Kaj does come to Chicago um, as does Akram Khan and many other companies. So I think that and we, I, I would like to believe that the Joffrey is a really collaborative organization. We do a lot with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in Chicago. Um, and so I think with the, our door is always open. And so we, we, we just leave it that way and it would be fantastic to, to look at that kind of collaboration. But I agree that both, we're both very physical companies. It was interesting because Robert Joffrey, he, he was a teacher first and foremost, I think. He was a teacher for us as, as company members and a teacher for his audiences. And 
um, always wanting to expand people's knowledge. Uh, his class was very classical and very strict, and the head had to be just so, and the arms had to be just so. And then we would go to rehearsal and, and be, you know, upside Wild. down and flying and sideways and uh, in sneakers, and um, I think that, in a way, informed the physicality in a, in a unique way because of the very classical, very strict training allowing us to then explore any kind of movement. Lizzie, I think I'm right in saying that Robert Joffrey said that classical ballet is our center, mm -hmm. but it is not our circumference. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, yeah. And if you think about, you know, he bought Twyla Tharp when Twyla Tharp was at the very beginning of her career, and, and I, you know, I know that it was not easy for the company mm -hmm to have this crazy lady from the village, you know, coming to work on a ballet company. But to the Beach Boys. To the Beach Boys. But Joffrey, he, he kind of pushed everyone to keep going. You had to keep going with Robert Joffrey. And what you got out of it was amazing. I think like Laura De working with Laura Dean. Yes. Uh, um, and you mentioned earlier uh, what made Joffrey different from other companies that I've worked with. As, as I mentioned, he was an educator first, so at the beginning of each season, he would seat us down, and he would have a table full of materials about to talk about the season we were going to do. An article about Court Yost, and lithographs, and photographs, and this incredible new artist, for instance, Laura Dean, who's been studying uh, dervish spinning in Turkey for the last three years, and is now bringing it onto uh, into a modern dance company and now on point with the Joffrey Ballet. And by the end of his discussion, we were so informed, we were so excited, we were just vibrating and ready for anything to come and understanding, I think, the feeling that we were a part of dance history. And I, I don't think it's uh, a coincidence that so many of my colleagues went on to run schools and companies and dance festivals and uh, arts organizations because we were a very informed arts army that left the Joffrey Absolutely. at the end of our careers. Well said. Yep. Question up there. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, me and my friend, uh, we just got our point shoes and watching you dance was um, very inspiring. Um, but we seen that you um, didn't have tights on and we were wondering, do you have toe pads on? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have toe pads on. Um, actually, they're new toe pads because my other ones had like really big holes in them. But yes, I do. Um, yeah. I'm not wearing tights right now because it's uh, part of the costume to not wear tights, but in the first piece I was wearing tights. <laughs> That, I thought, I think that was a, a perfect note to end this evening on. <laughs> and a wonderful question. Um, I'm, I'm deeply touched that you all came to join us tonight, and thank you for going on this journey of music and dance with us, and um, we hope to see you all at the Music Center in June. Thank you all. Good thank night. Thank you so thank much. You thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lizzie.